So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Nellie Stansbury, Denison Consulting's Marketing Specialist. I'm very happy to welcome you from around the world to Denison's second installment of our Resilience webinar series. To get started, please test the functionality of the questions and answers, the Q&A feature, uh, on this webinar by sharing where in the world you are joining us from. For those of you unable to join us for our first webinar, our, resili our resilience series focuses on the research Denison has done to help you understand the impact of the pandemic on your organization's people and performance. In our first webinar, we discussed some of our findings from the pro bono resilience assessment we offer to 40 plus clients. Today's webinar will explore some of those insights more deeply and will focus on consistency, teamwork, and work-life balance during the pandemic using the research compiled from the assessment. I want to now introduce our panelists. Joining us today are Brian, Corey, and Meredith. Brian Adkins is the CEO and a partner of Denison Consulting. He has been working with clients to build high performance cultures and leaders for over 20 years. Today, Brian supports many of our key clients and continues our tradition of linking thought leadership and practical insight for maximum impact. Corey Jackson serves as the consulting support manager at Denison. He joined the Denison team after working at the University of Michigan and has experience in teaching, management, hiring processes, customer support. His role at the company includes handling logistics, presentation development, and financial support for the senior consulting team. Meredith Gribb is a client success manager at Denison Consulting. She joined the Denison team after working internationally as a buyer in the automotive industry. With a passion for coaching and creating effective processes and teams, she works with our client success team to support clients as they walk through their unique transfer, as they walk through their unique culture transformations. While Brian, Corey, and Meredith present today, please utilize the Q&A function. I'll be monitoring your questions and comments throughout and looking for common themes that we can discuss at the end of the webinar when we've dedicated 15 minutes or so to answer all your questions. While many of you are familiar with our work, I wanna start with a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Denison Consulting is a firm focused on large scale culture transformation and leadership development, headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with a European office based out of Zurich, Switzerland. Our global reach has allowed us to do work in over 50 countries and to develop diverse research and diagnostics. Our purpose is to improve organizational performance by developing culture and leadership. Our global team of experts uses our set of diagnostic assessments rooted in research to provide transformation services to our clients. We do research on how organizations from all over the world work their way through culture change, but then the pandemic hit. In response, we focused on the pandemic and on the responses of organizations around the world. Our team developed a resilience assessment, a set of 10 questions on communication, technology, well-being, customers, and maintaining connection, accompanied by two open-ended questions. We then offered the assessment pro bono to all our clients and over companies from around the world. The first round of results is from 23 organizations and over 4,000 people. Before I turn the presentation over to our panelists, I'd like to give a quick overview of the assessment's results as context for the themes our speakers will focus on. Here are the 10 questions we asked and their average percent favorable. Overall, the results were very positive. We see high rankings for understanding policies and practices, the clarity of work goals and priorities, and the effectiveness of the organization's adaptability. While the results were quite positive, there are a few areas that are important to look at and improve upon, like coordinating effectively across different parts of the organization and people feeling heard by their leadership. To put these scores in context, even the lowest ones are nearly 20 points higher than we typically see for the average culture survey item, where favorable responses range from around 40 to 75%. To review the two open-ended items of the resilience survey, we analyzed nearly 3,000 comments from around 20 organizations. Our, our research and development team used a natural language processing approach to do this, which generated themes from the bottom up based on how words or phrases in the comments were grouped together. Overall, organizations are doing very well at top-down top activities. Employees were proud of their organizations, communicated transparently, and shared information, 
how they prioritize, prioritize and enabled employee health and safety, how they quickly allowed and enabled working remote, and how they maintained team contact and connection. The number one area employees spoke to needing more support in was understanding and supporting work-life balance and employee well-being, followed closely by a strong show of pride and appreciation for their organization. Other themes that emerged for where employees could use more support included facilitating effective team level communication and streamlining meetings, recognizing extraordinary effort through compensation and incentivizing, and continuing support for teams and employees. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Brian, Meredith, and Corey to take over and share their findings with us. Good afternoon, my name is Meredith Gribb, and it's been a, a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. All right. Before we dive in deeper into our discussion, I wanted to do just a very brief overview of the Denison model, as I believe that it will help inform our conversations and provide some needed context later on in our discussion. So with over 20 years of uh, industry research, we have found that culture can be divided into four different indices. These indices are adaptability, mission, consistency, and involvement. And within each indice, we have three unique traits. Uh, the traits that we'll be focusing on today are in the consistency indice. These would be coordination and integration, agreement, core values, and we'll also be focusing on team orientation. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, our team was in discussion of what areas of culture truly help build resilient uh, organizations. And in this discussion, what really popped out to me as a, a common theme and something that was very important was how do you build consistency in the midst of uncertainty? Something that our CEO, Brian, who will be discussing with you in greater detail was just about how do you balance that dynamic tension between being adaptable and flexible and the adaptability here in the midst of constant change, but also how do you balance and create consistency in the midst of so much ambiguity? Now, while it's easy to say that, yes, flexibility is the most important way that organizations can be successful, However, consistency helps provide framework and foundations and future sustainability. And the best way to build that consistency is through communication, both horizontally and also vertically as an organization. One of the top themes, as Nellie discussed from our resilience study, were how uh, participants and organizations were super appreciative of the effective communication that was already happening from organizations, but also one of the areas they felt that could use the most improvement was facilitating and creating better and more effective communication. Now, while communication is always important, the effective transfer of information throughout the organization creates greater alignment and higher, higher resiliency uh, during a time of so much unprecedented change. A lot of the comments that I read over were communicating the desire to remain informed and just greater transparency from their leadership team. Different ways and methods of communication and ways to increase transparency would be to increase the number of one-on-one -on -one check ins with employees. Not only does this show individual care for each and every employee, but it allows them to have time to speak with you and to have a voice, which is so important in building your culture and in building trust in your teams. This will encourage your teamwork and also clarify priorities of what needs to be accomplished and when it needs to be accomplished. And overall, this communication and the clarifying of priorities and expectations will help your teams be sustainable, effective, and efficient moving forward in a time of ambiguity and unprecedented change. At this time, I would like to invite Brian to speak more on best practices for building coordination and integration. Great. Thanks, Meredith. And I know Corey later on is going to go even deeper into some of the communication and teamwork uh, components that you were already talking about there. Uh, coordination and integration became important as we were looking at uh, what was happening from a resilience perspective. Nellie talked earlier about the data we had collected and 
one of the things that we noticed pretty quickly was that it was organizations who had paid a lot of attention to their culture, had been pretty diligent about the development of their culture, who were in fact among the first people to want to take us up on this offer and get some employee voice, employee feedback regarding resilience. Uh, and we also noticed that these organizations who had stronger than average cultures did quite well in terms of the overall feedback. Uh, approximately 90% of people felt like they were uh, well informed, they were getting clarity around policies, procedures, they had the tools they needed, et cetera. Uh, what we did see, and this was true even among some of the higher performing organizations, was that somewhere between 20 to 25% of the workforce was less clear about the coordinating uh, with their colleagues. So their ability to coordinate effectively with different parts of the organization, uh, their awareness of the priorities that others were working on in other parts of the organization. So we thought we'd take a little bit of time today to first of all, unpack this thing that we call coordination and integration. And there's a lot of different pieces to it, a lot of different components. One of the ways that I think about coordination and integration is to break it down by coordinating around knowledge and information. So sharing information, making sure people are well informed across the organization. Uh, the other piece is the coordination around the specific work activities that need to happen. So I'll start with the, the knowledge and information. And generally speaking, the organizations that we know that uh, do better than most uh, in the coordination piece, they believe that employees are curious, that they care about what's happening in the broader organization. And so there's a, a desire to keep people informed. Uh, they believe that people that have more information uh, and are more aware, will make better decisions, more informed decisions as they go about their work. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the more people understand about the bigger picture and things going on around them, they're able to set clearer priorities, uh, again, make more effective decisions, and innovation becomes important. When you have multiple people looking at problems, issues uh, from multiple perspectives, the opportunity for greater innovation uh, exists. Uh, obviously, sharing more information fosters transparency. Uh, it also promotes relationship building beyond just your own team. So that ability to network and get to know what others are doing and focusing on. Uh, and uh, I think one of the most important things about broader awareness is that it helps to minimize redundancies or the risk of competing activities. If I know what others are working on, I can see where their work overlaps, uh, perhaps is redundant with my work, perhaps is competing with my work, and we can, we can bring that to the surface. On the other side of this, the coordination of work activity, this is really about what's getting done and being able to first look at the interdependencies that we have with other departments, other locations, other functions, and how those interdependencies impact our ability to get the work done. Uh, so we encourage people to be thinking about the specific deliverables, those products, those services, the information, the work that you're trying to produce, and who's critical to making that happen. We know that also impacts internal efficiencies and quality. Uh, we sometimes people confuse consistency with process, uh, even at its worst bureaucracy. One of the things that we've learned is that the highly consistent organizations actually move quite quickly because they have values that guide their behavior. They know who they have to engage with. Uh, they make those more efficient decisions. So consistency can absolutely equal speed. And uh, we also know it's really critical to meeting and exceeding customer expectations because most of what we deliver to our key stakeholders and our customers requires a coordinated effort by people across the organization. So the focus becomes on quality outputs versus silo thinking and just self-preservation that uh, often drives that silo thinking. 
So here we'll share a few things. Um, I'll start with that knowledge and information sharing. And some of the things that we're seeing, both uh, sort of in a formal and informal way, uh, so companies, departments, teams sharing weekly updates. Uh, we know that right now we're all sort of hovering around that virtual water cooler. We don't have the opportunity in many cases to get uh, around the physical water cooler. So how do we keep people aware? And whether that's through virtual meetings, whether that's through emails, but just updating uh, what different departments, what different teams, what different groups are working on, uh, what are some of their key objectives, what are some of the results that they're accomplishing or achieving. Uh, inviting people from other teams to join meetings, and we'll talk a little bit more about one of the concerns that people have today, which is too many meetings, uh, often uh, too many uh, virtual and visual meetings <laughs> has been a concern. So it's, it's about balance when we're talking about meetings, but we also know that if you invite people from other departments, other teams to uh, join when they can, it, it helps to create broader awareness of what's going on across the organization. Uh, it can be really helpful to prevent some unintended consequences. So a team taking a set of actions where they have not considered uh, or foreseeing some of the implications in other parts of the organization. So by having people uh, from across the, the company there, that can help avoid some of those unintended consequences, or again, some of the conflicting or potentially redundant efforts. Um, identifying uh, some key individuals from other teams that you want to develop uh, or maintain a working relationship. A lot of us have go to people in other departments, other locations, other regions, et cetera, that we seek out for advice that we turn to when we have questions and we want to get a, a broader sense of what's going on. So it's really important at this point in time where you may not be able to just walk down the hall uh, to talk to that person, to be explicit in reaching out to people from other parts of the organization and keeping those um, other working relationships uh, going. And uh, again, this is an area that I know Corey will go into a bit more, but whether it's town hall meetings, all hands, I mean, the things that we're seeing right now, uh, huddles, virtual happy hours, um, team meetings where people are inviting people from other units, other departments, from anywhere in the world. You know, geography is certainly much less of a barrier when you're talking virtual, although you do have to be cognizant of time zones. Uh, Check-ins, you know, one-on-ones, not losing sight of the importance of those for your manager, uh, with your manager and other team members, uh, so you get that uh, additional perspective and support. So th those are some of the things people are doing just to share knowledge and information across the organization. Uh, when it comes to the work uh, and coordinating the work activity, uh, some of the things that we're seeing happen here is people getting much clearer uh, around stakeholders and who are the key stakeholders that they either rely on for information or inputs and who are the people that they then need to support as well. And so who are those stakeholders that you're dependent upon or are dependent upon you? Uh, much greater focus today on defining what the work is. What are those specific deliverables that we're expecting from each other? Uh, we can't just constantly sometimes interact and reshape as we're going. So uh, as much clarity and definition as we can put on the front end about what it is that we're trying to accomplish becomes really important. Uh, and from a how we get work done, setting some pretty explicit expectations, uh, contracting, setting some norms. Uh, because again, when there's less visibility uh, into uh, what others are working on, what some of their other competing priorities might be, both personal and professional. Uh, getting really clear about how often we need to check in, what's the timelines that we're all trying to uh, meet, how are we updating each other on progress, if conflicts arise, how are we gonna resolve those? So how we work together may require a, a bit more explicit attention than perhaps if we were more co-located and could give immediate feedback. 
And the last thing I talk about here is this opportunity or need to reset some of our mental models or perceptions of our colleagues. And one of the reasons why I talk about this is because I heard a story from a client recently where they were talking about one of their uh, coworkers who they used to be co-located with. And they were describing how efficient that person was and how responsive that person was and how they relied on them for uh, a lot of things. Uh, and now that they're no longer co-located and now that that employee is working from home where they've got family and other demands, uh, they noticed the responsiveness wasn't what it was when they were co-located. They noticed that there were some differences in terms of how that person was sort of showing up. And it requires all of us, uh, and Meredith is going to talk more about work-life balance, but it does require all of us to maybe reset some of our perceptions, uh, those mental models that we have of our coworkers. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Corey, and he's going to go a little bit deeper into the communication, collaboration, and teamwork. Thanks, Brian. Hey, everyone. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, virtual teamwork collaboration uh, post the global crisis we all know now as COVID-19. Um, and after this crisis, many organizations are now collaborating digitally more than ever. And some organizations have adapted and thrived in this new landscape. However, other organizations were not so prepared for this change. So what some of us might be asking ourselves is, what are these high performing organizations doing to foster teamwork and collaboration in this new digital age? As that's uh, definitely a challenge when you are not able to see people face to face at times. So before we answer that question, a little bit of a recap of the research again. So we collected data from over 4,554 individuals at over 24 organizations. And when we took a look at that data, what we found was that the most successful organizations did many things. However, in relation to teamwork, 53% of the respondents in our resilience data said that communication was a major factor of their success in terms of feeling that sense of teamwork. So the way that these organizations reinforce their levels of communication and their strategies help to inspire a stronger sense of teamwork at their organization. And really quickly, just a little bit of a view into the uh, comments that we received. So the first one here says, uh, the communication from leadership has been great. All the teams I work on have also adapted well to being away from the office. Another person says, I feel that our team is doing its best to stay connected, whether it's throwing in some virtual coffee breaks or even just constant communication, I can still feel our teamwork. And finally, our team has invited members of other teams to our morning virtual meetings. It's great to see others coordinate and remain connected. So one of the things you'll see repeated throughout those comments is staying connected and how that helped to inspire a greater sense of teamwork. So what does improving your teamwork and collaboration at your organization do for you besides get you some nice comments? Well, actually, there's some pretty tangible benefits to improving the communication strategies in your virtual teams. The first one is cost reductions. Moving more of your uh, operations to a digital platforms actually saves your organization money. That's less money spent on office space, on expenses for food and travel, office supplies, among other cost savings that you'll see by having more uh, virtual operations. Another thing is increased productivity. Contrary to the myth that people are less productive at home, uh, collaborating virtually and working from home has been shown to actually boost productivity. Um, and one of those reasons is just it's less distractions that you might see in the office. So that's more time that you get to focus on finishing up that project. And finally, it can help to improve the experience for your customers. When you have the capacity to provide a high quality virtual experience for your customer, 
It expands the products you can offer and improves your overall brand. And really quick before we move on, um, I want to share about our personal experience uh, at Denison with uh, this. Recently, we had to be faced with the challenge of adapting some of our consulting services to uh, meet the needs of our clients. And we had to reinvent ourselves. And it turns out that uh, we've received some great feedback from clients. And some of the services that we offer now have even improved since uh, transitioning to virtual. So it's great to have that mindset of being able to think more virtually and think about ways you can tackle those challenges. So now the moment you've been waiting for. What can you do to improve the virtual collaboration at your organization? Well, if you haven't already, you definitely want to start up a Monday huddle. Um, and sometimes you might think the Monday huddle only has to be project focused, but you can also just use this time to check in on your team and help build the connection. Um, you can cover things that happen over the weekend and the important family life events. Some people use this time to uh, shout out uh, team members that have helped them out throughout the week on projects. But the main purpose is that you want to build that connection and reinforce the support for your team with those Monday huddles. And following on that, you want to focus on building trust in your organization. And some ways that you can do that is by sending regular updates to your team, as Brian mentioned earlier. Um, that communication constantly to your team is going to help them uh, feel that they're supported and it's going to make them trust you more. And um, it's even better if you can send those communications at the same time, same day each week, because that's going to allow people to know what to expect when and when they can expect their updates. You also want to empower your team members to take initiative and reward success. Uh, one of the side effects of that improved productivity is sometimes people may finish projects sooner than before. And if you've got a little extra time on your hands, it's nice to have that ability to see where you can help out around the organization and it help out with the workload in other areas. So if you allow team members to have that ability to take initiative and then reward that effort, you're going to see a greater trust built between you and your team members. And finally, you want to allow them freedom to work. Um, schedules are, are different and Sometimes working from home, it makes it a little challenging to be available at the same hours. Um, so if you allow people to work at their own pace, you're showing them that you trust them and they will also trust you in response. And the way that you're allowed to give them that freedom is just make sure to set clear expectations and give concrete deadlines. And then finally, you wanna schedule time to connect. We kind of touched on this already, but just the importance of the weekly one-on-one uh, -on -one touch base with key team members, making sure that you're giving them that support that they need, and uh, also leaving in a little space for uh, personal chatting as well. And then finally, you want to uh, incorporate some icebreakers during town hall meetings, happy hours, just to break up the monotony of the work week, and it will help build that sense of teamwork and communication that you have in your organization. So ultimately, establishing clear communication with your team is how you're going to thrive in this new digital environment. And you want to focus on building trust and relationships, and that is going to be done through effective communication with your teams. And that is not only going to make your work more fun at your organization, but it's also going to boost productivity. And I just want to leave a note at the end that it's okay to set boundaries and maintain professionalism. We talk a lot about communication and relationships and the goal isn't necessarily to be uh, best friends with your coworkers, but you wanna establish this communication so that you can have trust and support in your team and that you know everyone is doing their part to help your organization thrive and prosper in the digital age. And, and when you do this, you're also going to see those benefits carry over post the pandemic and you'll be stronger than you were before coming in. And if you're able to maintain professionalism, kudos to you with uh, kids crying in the background and dogs barking. 
With that said, we'll pass it over to Meredith for her presentation on work-life balance. Thank you, Corey. So this was uh, shown towards the beginning by Nellie, um, but one of the, the common and the top theme that showed up in our data and in our analysis was the need for improved work-life balance and support and employee well-being from organizations. So because that was the top theme, we thought it would be important to just touch on that today. So first we'll focus on the themes and then we'll dive into some best practices and solutions for how to just handle those issues and create a success for your team moving forward. So I read hundreds and hundreds of comments referencing the need for improved work-life balance. Um, and I also did some personal interviews that just dove deeper into the topic. And there were several consistent themes that I saw reflected, um, not only in the personal interviews, but also in all of the comments. Um, and the first one was uncertainty on how to best prioritize ever-evolving demands in a new and ever-changing environment. Um, so just a lot of uncertainty and need for clarity and what are the expectations uh, from my leadership team, but also from my team in general, and how do I handle um, trying to balance not only my work, but also how do I create time for my family as well. And that leads us to the next one, family work pressures. There's a lot of participants who had family um, at home and had small children, or maybe they were trying to care give um, for an elderly parent, or there's a lot of just different pressures that come into play when all of the family is stuck in one location and at the same time you have emails and phone calls coming in from work. So just how do you balance that? Um, and then because of that, because of all of those pressures and stresses, there was a lot of concern brought up about burnout and exhaustion. Some of that too had to do with the fact that a lot of people felt increased pressure to constantly be on their computer, constantly responding to emails and to be available at all times. Um, and so we'll go into that a little bit later on. Um, and because it's a lot more difficult to, you know, you can't just stand up and walk across the hall and go to someone's office and say, hey, I have a question about A, B, and C, you know, now that turns into a one hour Zoom meeting. And a lot of the times, that there was an inefficient use of time and way too many meetings um, and that really needs to be addressed in the new virtual workplace. And then there was a lot of anxiety brought up about taking breaks and working a normal work schedule, especially just due to the fact that a lot of people were working flexible schedules and because of that you're getting emails at 9 o'clock, 10 p.m. and you're not sure, do, is there the expectation that I respond to these right now? Can I respond tomorrow? Is that okay? And with that was this concern of if I don't respond at all times, if I'm not consistently available, and if I'm not meeting what I think the expectations are placed on me, will I lose my job? Will I no longer be seen as essential? And I think that's something that organizations should be aware of, that there is that concern um, in the ever-changing workplace of, you know, is am I on a safe foundation? Can I trust in these work relationships? And what are these clear expectations? And just help relieve some of the anxiety that is on a lot of people's minds today. I think what's interesting is that, you know, we talked about the importance of communication and building consistency. And then Corey talked about the importance of communication and building strong and effective teams. And work-life balance comes down to communication. That is what really just drives um, a successful workforce and it helps create uh, clarity and, and expectations. Um, so uh, before I dive into best practices and solutions, I think it's important to note that work-life balance is something that organizations can and do impact, but it is also something that is a personal decision and choice. And I think that those two things work hand in hand. And so we'll just separate those um, and we'll focus first on what organizations can do. So the first um, thing that I noticed as a common theme that popped up in comments was just the need for people to hear from their organizations that they, there was understanding and empathy that it was a challenging work environment. Um, but not only that, I think it's important to keep in mind that you need to make space for and encourage lunch breaks and short you know time of just mental breaks and days off but if you're going to communicate 
that this is a priority for your employees, make sure that you lead by example. If you tell your employees that, yes, you can have a lunch break, I, I want you to take time um, just to have a minute to collect yourself, make sure that you don't schedule Zoom meetings during lunchtime. Uh, that's, that's really important. And I know this may seem simple, but in fact, many people are experiencing that constant need to be on Zoom when really all they need to do is clarify expectations and create a solution that best works for their team. Uh, next is clearly prioritize work tasks for employees. So we're talking about having those one-on-one -on -one check ins and how important it is to meet with your employees. And when you do that, you know, communicate, okay, here are all the tasks that you have for this week. Here are your priorities. And don't worry about these other ones right now. We'll, we'll handle those later on. But relieving that stress and that feeling from employees that all of that is dependent on them to figure out on their own, but instead to clarify for them what your expectations are. Um, it's very important that, that people don't feel like they're alone and that they have the ability to come to you if you're their supervisor and say, you know, I, I'm not really sure what to do right now. How do you want me to handle this? Um, so it's important to have those conversations and make sure that there's space for those conversations. On top of that, limiting meetings. While meetings are very important, important for having alignment, make sure that if it could be an email, just have it be an email. Don't schedule an hour meeting. Um, if you're going to have a meeting, have an agenda so that it's very clear set what the goals of that meeting are and it stays on track. And perhaps I, I saw one solution from comment, a uh, comment from a participant note that, you know, if we had meetings just in the front half of the day, then that would allow me to get work done in the second part of the day. So just think about that as we're moving forward, because for many companies, I know virtual, the virtual workplace is now the new normal. So we need to figure out what best works so that your employees can feel effective and that they can do the work that needs to be done and still feel like they're connected and are fully aligned as a team. And then facilitate conversations with employees that do have children or other work pressures or family pressures at home. So make sure that you know, you're working with them, create that flexibility if you can. And once you've created solutions for those employees, communicate that to the broader team so that they understand, okay, so this person can't do work you know, at this time, so they'll be responding later on in the evening, but there isn't this expectation from me that I respond in the evening as well. That's just when they're available to work. So clarify expectations, especially if you send an email, communicate, you know, I know I sent you this request, but I don't need a response back today. If you could get back to me by tomorrow, or if you can get back to me by next week, it's all about clarifying your expectations. You know, we have relationships outside of work and all of those depend upon clear communication. They all depend upon clearly communicating your expectations and, and having boundaries. And the same is for work relationships, the same is for your work teams. And it's important to build those, uh, those avenues for clear communication and clear expectations. Work-life balance is also a personal decision and choice. Take those short breaks. If your supervisor communicated, you can take a lunch break. You need to take that lunch break. You know, if, if you feel that anxiety about, I don't know if I can take this time, ask your supervisor. Say, you did say this was something that I could do. Is it okay if I take 30 minutes at this time? Clarify with them so that there isn't that growing anxiety within you. A lot of the times anxiety is because there isn't clarity. So just get the clarity that you need. Feel free to communicate and get expectations. Block off portions of your schedule throughout the day to get work done. Again, I would clarify with your supervisor that this is okay to do, but I know for me, at the start of the pandemic, I would have between five and seven Zoom meetings back to back, and I would have no breaks, you know, wasn't able to eat lunch during those times, and I, I found that that really wasn't sustainable, and to be sustainable, I needed to block off little hour portions throughout my work week of time that I could get client work done or even just to take a 30 minute lunch break. And, and I clarified with my supervisor, is it okay if I take this time? And it totally was. And the good thing about that was that my team was able to see when I was available and when I needed to get work done and that was respected. And that, that helped build um, just trust as a team as well because there was understanding of in greater transparency of what's going on and we saw best how to help each other and partner with each other. And then, as we mentioned before, prioritize your task list and confirm these priorities with your supervisor and just make sure that you're on track. 
Um, they know that you want to be successful and to do that you just need to clarify your, the priorities and make sure that you know you are being effective and just just say I, I want to be effective I want to be efficient and do a good job for a team how can I do that and how can you help help me you know best be a part of our team and truly just uh, work as a team to to move forward something that we had mentioned at the very beginning was the importance of core values and building consistency and that may seem like it doesn't fit but it, it actually does because your core values they help create a framework and foundation and building blocks for you in your team to know how to communicate it provides a common language it provides common goals um, it shows you how you communicate and provides that framework for how you make decisions and take steps forward um, we define core values as they reflect a common set of beliefs and behaviors deemed important to the identity of the company. They help you with those decision-making processes and they increase your team alignment. Some important questions to ask are, are you staying true to your company values during this period of disruption? Are your core values just something that are on a poster on the wall of your office? Or are they something that are transparent and obvious part of your work day? Are they an obvious part of your communication as a team? If not, that's okay. There, there's, it's not too late. You know, it's just take the time to meet with your team, create those core values, create that foundation so that you can take steps forward as a team, as a unified force. And what do your values look like in practice in this new environment? Maybe the values need to be revisited and just to see, you know, how do they best work for your team? They help set you apart from your organizations. They serve as a source of pride and they unify your virtual workforce. That is the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, just as a quick wrap up, the importance of consistency is driven by and built by communication. That communication builds trust and helps your teams be aligned and effective and creates an overall um, ease in having work-life balance because it allows you to establish and maintain expectations and priorities as a team. Thank you so much for your time. And I'll now, uh, invite Nellie just to do the question and answer session. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into the Q&A session, um, just wanted to highlight some of our upcoming events and resources and to touch upon the fact that the results that uh, Meredith, Corey, and Brian discuss clearly demonstrate the importance of an organization's people um, and to better support you and to ensure that you're people and leadership are healthy. Um, we, we have these upcoming events and resources to offer you. Um, the publication of three thought leadership articles to correspond with today's webinar topics authored by today's panelists. So Meredith and Brian will be publishing an article together. Meredith will be publishing a separate article on her own and Corey will be publishing an article. Um, stay tuned for dates when those are publishing and we'll get those out to you by email and social media and whatnot. We have an upcoming certification workshop in August, um, which helps you unpack all of Denison's models, tools, methodologies um, for better understanding your own culture. And the date and topic of our next webinar tentatively scheduled for late August. Um, we'll be sure to give you guys some details about that. And lastly, another thing that is in the works um, is a diversity and inclusion module and assessment, um, especially relevant in today's, in today's world that we're trying to uh, better support you guys and help you guys understand uh, where your company and culture are and how they're being impacted by the world's social, political, et cetera, um, factors. So there were a lot of really great comments and questions um, one sort of housekeeping question that I'll touch on up front was that we, we are recording the webinar and uh, I'll be sending out the recording of the webinar by email and social media in the next few days. Um, more in depth, I think. Um, a lot of the questions seem to focus on balance. So Corey and Meredith both spoke about um, balancing communication. Um, how do you balance uh, being fatigued and over communicating with um, under communicating? How do you ensure that people aren't 
stressed by the amount of communication that they're receiving and or that they're not left in the dark about what's happening in their company. How do you guys find that balance? I think uh, it's trial and error uh, is a great way to start. So if you start with, um, and Corey, feel free to jump in here, but if you start maybe with a Monday huddle as he had recommended and then having you know, a one-on-one -on -one check in uh, either once a week or, you know, every other week and, and just ask yourself the question, is this working? Do I feel like I have enough information? If I don't have enough information, you know, maybe I need either more clarity, uh, send an email or set up another time for connection. Um, if you feel like you have enough or maybe too much, just ease that back a little bit. Maybe, you know, only have a check-in every other week, every two weeks, you know, make it tailor fit to your schedule and make sure you're having that open communication uh, with your team and with your supervisor so that you can best be effective. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that, Corey? I think that was a great answer. Yeah. All right, another question that we got um, this was about the distinctions of home and work distractions. So probably another answer for Meredith. Um, but also Corey. Uh, Corey mentioned that uh, people were pretty productive when working at home, um, more so than, than he and or our team anticipated seeing. Um, what are the differences in home and work distractions and how do you best, how do you best stay productive are there any similar trains, trails, or themes between those two types of distractions? Is one harder than the other, et cetera? So I would say that um, in terms of being in the office space, you're more expected to socialize with others being in the office. And it's just kind of hard to avoid that someone is going to come into your office or come into your space with a question. Uh, you, you're going to feel more uh, res responsible to get up and go to lunch with people. And there's just the, the key aspect of constant socialization that you're going to see in the office that you aren't necessarily going to have working from home virtually. Um, your, your interruptions are more planned now. Uh, you'll have meetings scheduled. You'll have uh, less um, just constant socialization responsibilities. And I would say that's one of the key differences in terms of the distractions that uh, you're going to experience. Um, and uh, happy for anyone else to add to that if you see anything else. There. I think it's important to create boundaries for yourself. So if you feel like you're not getting the work done that you need to be getting done to set aside time in your schedule and that you'll know, okay, you know, during this hour, I'm going to create a presentation, um, you know, and then that allows for greater flexibility to have those distractions or, or to connect with people as needed. But uh, it all comes down to setting the boundaries for yourself. Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think, I think Meredith described it quite well when she said trial and error, uh, because I think we have to keep in mind that what's going on in the environment today is impacting different people in different ways. Uh, many people, you know, like myself, I have essentially, when I'm not out traveling, working with clients, which have not been able to do for a while now, uh, but have worked from home for quite some time and you learn how to make that work for you. Uh, you learn that when you're not in an office setting surrounded by others, that a lot of times it's on you to reach out and ask questions, get information that you can't just naturally pick up by being amongst your, your colleagues. And of course, for people who are much more accustomed to being around others and uh, you know, just being exposed to a lot of different conversations, information, a lot of the things that you would gain in an informal way, uh, you don't see it, you don't hear it the way you used to. And so it's a very different uh, way of operating for people who were more accustomed to that physically co-located uh, experience. And I think one of the things that people are trying to uh, sort through is, yes, there's a lot more, you know, whether it's Zoom or WebEx, whatever the virtual meeting uh, platform is, there's a lot more of that going on. 
Uh, and so people are feeling a bit more overwhelmed with meetings. But I also think that if they stopped and thought about, uh, for those people who did work in a more co-located environment, just the informal discussions that they would have throughout the day, it, but it feels more formal now that it's happening uh, electronically versus just passing in the halls. So maybe the interaction is not necessarily all that much more, uh, but the, the way it's happening feels more formalized than perhaps informal. Well, I have another question for probably Brian, um, talking about working cross-functionally and the difficulties that come with that. Um, do you think that working virtually will strengthen teams' abilities to work cross-functionally? Um, if there are new ways that people have been experimenting with working with teams across the organization um, that they're implementing virtually, do you think that those will transfer over to working cross-functionally in the same place? Uh, that's a great question. I think, uh, I think if employees and teams try to be more intentional about it, uh, then there's the, certainly the potential that coordination and integration could improve. Uh, I think my concern is, and this you know, goes back to just our broader cultural work, is that for organizations where coordination and integration was maybe difficult before, this has the potential to exacerbate that and make it even more challenging. Um, and in organizations where coordination and integration was strong and people did it well, I think uh, they'll, they'll find ways to continue that in this virtual environment. Uh, so I think, uh, I, I think what we know is that whether it's in a virtual environment or a co-located environment, coordination and integration takes real concerted effort to reach out to other teams, reach out to other leaders, reach out to other parts of the organization to better understand what they're doing, how their work impacts you and vice versa. We also know that coordination and integration is of all the areas of the Denison model, one of the more challenging pieces of it. So I think this is also gonna be another one of those uh, sort of trial and error uh, where people are gonna learn what works or what uh, doesn't necessarily work. But I do think it's gonna require a lot more intentionality on people's part to facilitate that coordination. All right, I have one more main theme, um, and that revolves around trust and empowerment, especially in virtual work. Um, so whoever feels like they or all of you want to chime in for this, um, you guys are all welcome. But twofold, I think. Um, what does the increase in team productivity tell you about monitoring individuals' works um, and, and maybe will this period of time empower leaders to trust their people to work remotely or to trust them and more in general to empower them to decide their work schedules and the way that they uh, prioritize work in a virtual way rather than being told specifically by their leaders when and what they should be working on um, and if there are any recommendations or strategies to build trust to create a space for good communication for leadership or for organizations. I trust my colleagues have a good answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I have seen um, that there has been greater empowerment and greater flexibility from leaders and organizations to allow their employees to work virtually just because they've seen that it's been successful. And I think where areas where it hasn't been as successful, it's, it's just because there hasn't been enough adjustment, uh, enough flexibility to create the changes that needed uh, to happen. I think um, strategies have a lot to do with clear communication and expectations. And, and I think when leaders allow not only their employees to have a voice and to work with them hand in hand and 
in saying, you know, how can we best be effective as a team in this new environment when they allow space for that? I think that they will see how much their employees care um, and how much their their teams care about the organization being successful. And, you know, just allowing that space of where employees can voice their thoughts and, and to join into that conversation, but also just being transparent as a leadership team and communicating the goals of the organization and, and trying to come together hand in hand. Um, and that's a lot of where those, those core values come into play as well, because it creates those common goals and uh, helps you um, step, take steps forward together with a common language. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things with trust is I do think I, I do think for a lot of organizations who have had to significantly shift the way that they operate and particularly have more people working uh, from home or outside the workplace, uh, I, I think there'll be probably some kind of an evolution that may start with uh, sort of a trust but verify uh, mindset uh, where people may not be able to just completely trust that others are doing what they say they're going to do and working as hard as they expect them to work, et cetera. Uh, so there may be a little bit of trust, but verify initially where I, I have to trust that people are doing the right things. Uh, but I also check in or have some kind of processes uh, in place to, to verify that we're getting the work done. But I do think that will evolve, and I do think people will become more trusting of their colleagues, more trusting of their ability to prioritize, more trusting of their ability to organize their schedules in a way that they can be most productive, still meet the expectations that we've set. And that's when I said earlier about uh, getting clearer about the work. I think that's going to be one of the things that's going to you know, continue to happen here is people will have to be much clearer about the deliverables and expectations that they have for one another uh, and then be able to step back and allow that to happen. Thank you guys. Um, I think that since we're nearing the top of the hour, we're not going to get into another deeper question. But for those of you whose questions went unanswered, we're going to download all of these and be sure to reach out to you guys to make sure we answer them to the best of our ability. Um, so I guess that is uh, a good wrap up for us in general. Um, you'll be hearing from us by email, via social media. Um, we hope that you'll join us for our next webinar, which that will be coming up in late August and we'll announce the specific date and the theme in the next few weeks. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and taking some time in the middle of your day or end or beginning of your day. Uh, we hope that you've learned a lot and that we will continue to learn with you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.